Good morning. Glad that you're here. Happy New Year to you. For those of you who are around, know that I have to bring a prop. This is my prop. I'll leave it right here. But uh, I'm excited about the new year. Um, I love the possibilities that new year holds. I love new stuff. How many of you got what you wanted for Christmas? How many of you got what you deserve for Christmas? Yes. So I'm excited about this new year. I'm excited. One of the things I'm excited about is I get to be a part of a new, uh, a new group, a new ministry called Remix. It's, uh, it's designed for those who are Gen Xers. If you don't know what a Gen Xer is, uh, they are people who stuck between millennials and boomers. They're, they're called the lost generation, bless your hearts. The, the lost generation is the Gen Xers. Uh, Gen Xers are typically ha- are empty nesters, or they have uh, kids who are in middle school or high school. Uh, they, are, they are part of a group of people called the sandwich generation. Everyone goes, oh man, I want to be a part of something to eat, you know. Uh, the sandwich generation is a group of people who take care of their kids and take care of aging parents. So those are what Gen Xers are. So if that kind of fits you, you were born in the mid-60s to 1980-ish, and that's you, I'd love for you to join us next Sunday. Uh, we're going to meet every Sunday in the Overlook Room beginning next Sunday at 9 o'clock. If you're interested, you've got questions about what that looks like, write that on the back of your connection card, and uh, I'll be in touch with you, let you know what's going on. We're going we're gonna to share a little bit. We're going to snack a little bit. We're going to smile a little bit. We're going to study a little bit. We're going to have a lot of fun. And uh, so, but if you, are, if you are also a boomer, I lead a group up there at 1030. That's why you won't see me much. Pastor's got me up there. And so if you want to find me, I'll be up in the Overlook Room. But if you're a boomer, um, we'd love to have you join us um, beginning at 1030. And we, we're already started. They're up there uh, taking their medications or doing whatever they're doing up there now. <laughs> so I'd uh, love to have you, have you part of that. So... Um, you can jot that down on the back of your connection card as well. I'm excited about sharing week two uh, with you, the fundamentals of following. It's not fundamentals of following Trump on Twitter, all right? So if you came this morning and said, oh, there's going to be a message on following uh, that's not Trump on Twitter, all right? That's not what it's about. And the word fundamentals, you can't spell it without the word fun, right? So we're going to have a little fun this morning, hopefully. But before we dive in... um, how many of you made a New Year's resolution? And how many of you have still kept your New Year's resolution? Really? Six days in? That's like a record, right? Six days in? All right. How many of you did not make a New Year's resolution? Wow. How many of you said my New Year's resolution is to never make a New Year's resolution? Yeah, you're the only people that kept your New Year's resolution. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm excited about that. Now, if you made a New Year's resolution to be in church every Sunday in 2019, you're off to a great start. You're off to a great start. Glad you're here. You've got 51 more to go, so the countdown is on. So we're excited. We're glad that you're here. Now, if you did make a New Year's resolution, I want to give you some advice on how to maintain that throughout the year, all right? I'm not the king of New Year's resolutions or anything like that, but um, I do give free advice. So tell me what you think the number one New Year's resolution is for 2019. Boy, that's what they said first hour. Boo! No, we don't want to lose weight. No, that's not number one. It goes along with that, though. Exercise. Boo! <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Eat healthier. There you go. All right, so here's my advice for you to eat healthier. So if you're one of these people that want to eat healthier in 2019, I did some research with my crack staff of me, myself, and I. We did a research of this, and there's only two foods that have never been recalled. Right? Two foods. Ready? Fancy Feast and Meow Mix. (laughs) My advice to you, go home, clean out your fridge, go to the store, buy some Meow Mix, some Fancy Feast. All right? You'll live maybe through the end of 2019. All right? All right. How about number two? So number one is eat healthy. Number two? Save money. Perfect. Were you in first hour? All right, save money. All right, so here's my advice for you to to save money. Uh, Outrun your children. Outrun your children. You you know, I've heard it said that uh, you can't take it with you. When my kids come home from school, they, you know, they get all I got and they take it with them. That's why I can't take it, is they've already got it and they're gone. So if you want to save money, uh, outrun your children. And then the third, what's what's the number three? You already said it once. 
exercise. Right. Now, I don't consider myself a wicked man. All right? I consider myself a pretty good man. But here's what the Bible says about exercise, running, and all that stuff. How many of you are runners? Pastor. <laughs> I'm not committing. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, I just want to let you know it's good to be part of your family. <laughs> Staff meeting, I guess, will be over for me. All right, so here's what Proverbs chapter 28. This is right out of the Bible, NIV, right out of the Bible. The wicked man runs even though no one is chasing him. The wicked man, uh, listen, I'm not running unless somebody's chasing me. That's what the Bible says right here. The wicked man runs even though no one is chasing So if you run, you're wicked. If you run and no one's chasing you, you are wicked, all right? Now let me give you another, listen, there's more than one Bible verse about exercise and running. 1 Timothy 4, 8, exercise profiteth little. Now there's more, now there's more to that. Don't say, oh, Pastor Mike's taking it out of context. Yeah, I did, take it out of context, but those are my three favorite words right there, exercise profiteth little. So if you want some scripture on why you should not exercise, that is it. Well, I love New Year's resolutions, and, uh, and for the most part, New Year's resolutions are designed for us. They're, they're, they're designed to be about us. But what if we could make a New Year's resolution that both improved our lives and at the same time improved the lives of the people we come in contact with? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? That'd be a win-win. Not just us improving our lives, but what if we can improve the lives of the people that we come in contact with? Well, I do. As Dustin said last week that he enjoys this time of year. I love this time of year. Thanksgiving all the way to the New Year. Uh, we got Thanksgiving and Christmas. My birthday's in there. And uh, if you don't know when my birthday is, it's on the 28th of December. Just write that down on the back. My size will change between now and then, so you can't buy me clothes. And so New Year's, uh, New Year's is pretty cool too. So I've got, I got for my birthday, I've got to tell you this, but for my birthday, i got a Spam Slicer. Anybody get a Spam Slicer for your birthday? You, you can't have mine. Anyway, I, as, as I say in my groups, I digress. I, that's not in my notes. Anyway, I love this time of year. I love looking back over the years. I love uh, looking back when I was a kid and growing up and all the things that I did, all the memories I made, all the traditions that we did. And growing up in Canada, every year we got for Christmas was a hockey stick and a ball of twine to fix our goal. You know, all the time I shot holes through my hockey net. So Santa was very good about leaving a hockey stick and a ball of twine to fix the net instead of giving me a new net but I'm not bitter, right? I still love Santa. So those were outdoor toys, but we always got indoor toys as well. And uh, so I brought an indoor toy uh, with me today. This is an indoor toy um, I got. Uh, and in this bag is that, is that toy that I got as a kid. And uh, there have been more than 175 million of these toys sold throughout the world since 1960. It's in the National Toy Hall of Fame. It's appeared in a number of movies, including Toy Story and Elf. It doesn't connect to Wi-Fi. It doesn't have Bluetooth capabilities. It has no batteries. But like millions of kids, when I got this, I was both fascinated by it and frustrated by it. Does anybody know what's in this bag? Not a spam slicer. No. <laughs> what did you say? A slinky. No, it's not a slinky. Oh, you guys are so smart. An Etch-a-Sketch. How many of you have ever had an Etch-a-Sketch? Oh, good. Oh, good. How, how, many, how many of you uh, get frustrated by it? Yeah, the same people who got it are the same people who are frustrated by it. That's how it works. That's how it works. Cool. And, and so I, I got up early, early in the morning, and I started playing with it, but I, I couldn't figure out which knob went up, which knob went down, which knob went left, which knob went right. I'm like, oh, my goodness. My, my poor drawing looked... Uh, looked awful, um, but there's something about the Etch-a-Sketch that makes it a very cool toy. Who knows what that is? Creativity. There you go. Anything else? What makes this toy a very cool toy? Shake it. Turn it over and shake it, and it's all gone. Turn it over and shake it, and it's all gone. How many of you have ever done that? You've drawn it, you look at it and go, oh, disgusting. Turn it over and shake it, right? You know what you have just done? You have just shared good news. 
You know it, you experienced it, and you told me about it. You know that God loves you, you experienced the love of God, and you shared it. That's exactly how you share good news. It's not that complicated. You know it, you experienced it, and you shared it. Easy. Easy. Well, I've had 50 years to play with this thing. And so I want to show you a drawing that I did this past week just to show you how amazing I am. There it is. <laughs> Wait a minute. Thank you. You guys aren't supposed to laugh at people's mistakes. What kind of Christ followers are you? So, yeah, that's a flag of the half staff because I couldn't figure out how to stop my line when it kept going up. And so... Didn't want to erase it because it erased out the beautiful house and the tree and the two bushes next to it. Yeah, those are bushes next to my flag at half staff. Yep, that's 50 years of work right there, ladies and gentlemen. So that's nothing. If you watch Toy Story, then you probably saw this one. Yeah, now, that's not mine. The thing I know about the artist of that one is that I am sure... I have great confidence that they had to turn over and shake it dozens and dozens and dozens of times. I know that they needed a clean slate. I know they needed do-over after do-over after do-over to get to that place. And I know that in my life and in your life, I need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of do-overs in my life in order to get to that place where God wants me to be. The good news is in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21, it says that his mercies are new when? Every morning. I don't have to wait to 2020. His mercies are new every morning. I got 360 more chances to get his mercy, to get a do-over, to have a clean slate. And the fact is that if I want a clean slate, I don't have to wait even for the morning. So he'll do it for me even right now. So there are some of you, even today, that need a clean slate. 2019, you need a clean slate. You need a do-over. You need a new start. You need to, be, you need to be, be and have things in your life that only God can do. And so for some of you, 2018 was disastrous. You could hardly wait for it to be over. You had a loss of life or maybe you lost your job. And maybe you got sick. Maybe you had some health issues. Whatever it looks like, 2018 was gone. But there are some that are looking forward to 2019 having a new baby. Maybe you're you're going to get a new house or a new car or a new promotion at work. Whatever the case might be, you're looking forward to 2019. And some of you might even be unfamiliar with this whole term of a clean slate. Slates were hung in, in schools. My mom was a one-room schoolhouse teacher, and there would be a slate there, a board, and later called blackboards or chalkboards, and the teacher would use chalk, to write on the board, you take an eraser and you can erase that off and you wipe the slate clean. Now, if you had trouble in school, if you, you know, kept pulling the hair of the girl in front of you or you couldn't pay attention long, then you were invited to stay after school and clap erasers. Anybody have to do that? Yeah, me and Pastor. <laughs> Becky, really? Uh-oh. We all need a fresh start. We all need a clean slate. So we find through scriptures, both men and women, Old Testament and New Testament, of people who need clean slates, who need do-overs, who need a fresh start. We see David in the Old Testament, First and Second Samuel, we see David, he, he killed bears and lions and, and he killed Goliath, but he's the same guy that lusted after Bathsheba and had her husband killed and they had a son together and that son died. If anybody needed a clean slate, it was David. And David wrote in Psalm chapter 51 his repentance, and you can read it there. But after his repentance, he wrote in, in Psalm 71, verse 15 through 19, this is what he said. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know how to relate them all. I, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds and yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation. 
Your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, who is like you, God. That's what David said. That was David's testimony. He's going to proclaim God's goodness even when he's old and gray. And not only did he say that, but he said in Psalm chapter 40, verse 3, he says that God put a new song in his mouth and many will see and trust him. The New Testament is full of people who had to have their slates cleaned as well. The woman at the well, the man at the pool of Bethsaida, the man filled with demons, Zacchaeus, the disciples, and most famously, the Apostle Paul. All had to have clean slates. All had to have a new start. All had to have a do-over. And all were able to share the good news of what God did for them. The woman at, in the well, at the well found in John chapter 4, Jesus trailing from Judea, to Galilee. He passes through Samaria and stopped at a well for water when he encountered a woman who had five husbands and the one that she has now doesn't belong to her. Verse 28 says that she left her jar of water and returned to town. She shared her Jesus moment. She shared what Jesus did for her and how he forgave her and what that looked like. And in verse 39 of John chapter 4 it says many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Because of her story, because of her encounter with Jesus, she was able to share with the others in Samaria what Jesus had done, and many came to believe in him because of her story. John chapter 5, there's an invalid man healed at the pool of Bethsaida. He said in John 5.15, he said, it's Jesus that made me well. Luke chapter 8, we find a demon-possessed man who had his slate clean. A demon-possessed man, Luke chapter 8. He was given a new life. He wanted, to, he wanted to go back in the boat with the disciples and with Jesus and follow him back over to the other side. And Jesus said to him, no, you can't do that. This is what I want you to do. This is what he said in Luke 8, 39. Jesus said, return home and tell how much God has done for you. And the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. See, Jesus could have got the disciples out of the boat and said, hey, go knock door to door and tell them how much I love them. But this demon-possessed man who got a clean slate was able to do it more effectively because they could look at his life and say, wow, you're different. God has done a great thing in you. Acts chapter 9, Saul, who later became Paul, persecuted believers, persecuted Christ followers, and he had an encounter with Jesus and became a Jesus follower. And then the Lord says in Acts 9.15 that Paul would be his instrument to proclaim his name to the Gentiles and to their kings. God has a great desire to wipe your slate clean. He has a great desire to give you a do-over. He has a great desire to give you a fresh start in 2019. But why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because he loves you? Yeah. But he proved that 2,000 years ago. No greater love than this than a man lay down his life for another. When Jesus died on the cross, he proved he loved you. He doesn't need to prove anything else. He doesn't need to prove anything else. He loves you. So why would he give you good gifts? Why would he do that? Let's look at Psalm 23. We read Psalm 23, and this is what we, I read it yesterday at a funeral. And we read Psalm 23, and it makes us feel good. And this is what it says. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the paths. Why? Last line. For his name's sake. Not David's name's sake, not for my name's sake, not for your name's sake. Why does he do all those things? Why can we say, I lack nothing? It's not for me, it's for him. Everything he does is for him. Everything he does for us is ultimately done for him. Not my name's sake. He doesn't do that for me. I benefit that. But it's ultimately for his glory. Listen, the reason God gives you a clean slate is to bless you, yes, but ultimately to bless others and ultimately to glorify him. Everything he does is for his glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31, that's what it says. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Listen, we have this idea that we've done 
everything on our own. I got the job promotions because of who I am. I got this, and I got that, and I did this, and I did that. And the truth is, we are weak. I can do nothing without Christ. I can do all things through Christ, who what? Gives me strength. Everything is His. The Bible says that the earth is His, and the fullness thereof, everything is His. Last Sunday, um, Dustin did a great job of teaching us about uh, uh, Matthew 28, verse 19. And, and it says, go into all the world and make disciples, or make Christ followers. That's what, it, that's what it tells us to do. In this portion of Scripture, Jesus is more concerned about the mission. In this portion of Scripture, He's concerned about the mission, where to go and what to do, than He is with the word go. He's more concerned about the mission, where to go, what to do, than is this word go. He's going to assume that you're going to go. When he said to his disciples, follow me, it wasn't in thought and it wasn't in theory, it wasn't in philosophy, it was in action. Because Jesus was all about moving. The only time Jesus stopped was to pray. Everything else he was moving. So this is not a philosophy, this is not a theory, this is action, this whole idea of following so the more literal translation of this portion of Scripture and the word go is not go, it's as you are going. It's not go, it's as you are going. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey. The Great Commission is not about a missions trip. The Great Commission is not about a missions trip, it's making every trip a mission. Every trip a mission. Not a missionary trip. Your trip to the store, your trip to Walmart. Your trip to Kroger. Your trip to the gym for those who go. The two or three of you who go. Your trip to the soccer field, your trip to the football field. Your trip to the office, your trip to the church. Your trip to Disney, your trip to Africa, your trip to Haiti. It's not about a missions trip, it's about making every trip a mission about being missional. It's about the mission of sharing the good news as you go. Matthew 9, 35, 38, Jesus traveled through their towns and villages teaching and proclaiming the good news. Get that? Jesus traveled through their towns and villages teaching and proclaiming the good news. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus was going from Judea to Galilee and passed through Samaria and ministered to a woman on the way. Jesus ministered to, to her where? At the water cooler. It says the well, it's the water cooler. He ministered to her where she was at the water cooler. You pass by people at the water cooler, and you know what I mean by that. You pass by them, minister to them there. Jesus ministered to her at the water cooler. In, sto in the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector says that Jesus was passing through. In Luke 10, talks about the Good Samaritan, which assumes that every other Samaritan was bad except for this one guy. Uh, but a, a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, the beaten up man. And he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's most likely that the Samaritan was also traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was traveling on the same road as this man got beaten up. And the Good Samaritan stopped and helped him along his way. And God will put people in your path along your journey that's going to fall out of a tree for you to minister to, don't step on the other side. I don't know their names. It just says the Good Samaritan and a man got beaten up. But I can tell you one thing. When the Good Samaritan stopped to help this man up, he said, what's your name? And he goes, oh, you must be the Good Samaritan. No. He did not care who that man was because he was beaten up. He was in a place where he needed care. He didn't care if he was a Good Samaritan, Bad Samaritan. He just knew he was going to get some help. And so that's where you come in. As you're traveling along the road of life, God will put people in your path to minister to, to share God's love. One of the fundamentals of following Jesus is to share his gospel, his good news, his love with people he puts along your path. See, sharing the gospel means sharing the good news of God's love, not just good news of what happened in your life. See, we have this, we have this tendency to tell people all the good news, all the things that's happened in our life. I had a lady this morning says, I'm going to be a grandma for the first time. She wanted to share that good news. I, I had two that says, you know, in 2018, I got a new house, or I got new this, or I got new that. Sharing the good news of what happens in your life is simply good news. 
But if you give God glory for it and understand that God gave that to you, then now you're sharing not good news, but that good news. So if you tell people at work, uh, you tell people along, along your journey that you got a promotion at work, that's great. If you tell them that God gave you a promotion at work, that's good news. That's not just a good news. That's the good news. If you're telling people that uh, you're, you're dealing with addictions and, a, and I'm doing pretty good with my addictions, that's good news. But if you say God's helping with my addiction, that's the good news. See, God is the in the good news. God is the, the in the good news. I don't expect you to write that down, right? He is not just a way. He's the way. He's not just a good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's not just a door. He's the door. He's not just a gate. He's the gate. He's not just a rose of Sharon. He's the rose of Sharon. He's not just a part of life. He is the life. He's not just a bit of truth. He is the truth. Everything is about him. Everything is about him. When we share the good news... When we share the good news and give God glory for it, it becomes his good news and it proves that he's alive. It proves that he is alive and well. So on Sunday, today, man, I, I, I love the praise and worship today. I thought, it was, I thought it was fantastic. I love praising God corporately together as believers from all over the valley coming together and praising the name of Jesus in song. But how about if after today we go out and we raise the name of Jesus to all of our communities, to all of our paths, to everywhere that we go. We, do, we come on Sunday and we praise him together corporately. When we go out there, we raise the name of Jesus together corporately everywhere we go. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. If I am lifted up, I'll draw them into myself. I'll do the hard part. See, we have this idea, we're going to share the gospel. I can't do that. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know what verses to do. You don't have to do any of that. You just lift his name and he'll draw people to himself. That's all you have to do. The most effective way to share the gospel. Now get this. I want, I want to make sure you hear me. The most effective way to share the gospel is not to tell people what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago. The most effective way to share the gospel is not to tell people what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago. It's tell people what Jesus did for you 20 minutes ago. It's not about telling what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Tell them what Jesus did for you 20 minutes ago. See, Jesus' resurrection story, your resurrection story, will be their resurrection story. We sang about it today. The, the God who resurrected is resurrecting me, and it will resurrect the people you come in contact with. Jesus' resurrection story, your resurrection story, will be their resurrection story. But you first have to tell them what Jesus did for you 20 minutes ago. You're going to turn them off. You say, 2,000 years ago. They want to know Jesus is alive, and they can see that Jesus is alive through your word and through your deed. The, uh, there was a theologian uh, named Martin Luther. He was a German theologian and a priest in the 1500s. He said this about being a Christ follower. Martin Luther, 1500s, said this. Being a Christ follower is nothing more than one beggar showing another beggar where the bread is. One beggar showing another beggar where the bread is. That's all it is. We can't complicate it any more than that. You know where the bread is, and you tell somebody else where the bread is, and you quit hoarding it. You don't hoard it. You found the bread. I found the bread of life. I found the bread. I'm going to share the bread, and I'm not going to hoard it. That's what it is. One beggar showing another beggar where the bread is. That's all it is. Martin Luther on his deathbed said, we are all beggars. We are all beggars. We are either looking for bread or we're showing somebody else where the bread is. That's our job as a, as a Christ follower. That's our duty as a Christ follower. We're either seeking out the bread or we're, we found the bread and we say, hey, listen, here's the bread, here's the bread, here's the bread, here's where you get it. Here's where you get it. 
One of the fundamental ways of following Christ is to share the good news of where they can find the bread. Where can they find the bread? The thing I value about groups uh, with seasons of life like, uh, like children's ministry, youth ministry, uh, young adults, um, family ministry, um, encore, remix, men's groups, women's groups. The thing I value about those is that we can share with each other where to find the bread and learn from each other where to find the bread. God has given us an amazing ability to share his good news. An amazing ability. In this, in this day, in this technology, we have the amazing ability to share his good news with those along our journey. Some of you will do it through word. You've got, you got an amazing way of sharing through word. Others will have to do it through deed. We should be looking for ways to do uh, acts of random kindness. Acts of random kindness. Do you know you can't spell Parkway with A, R, okay? Acts of random kindness. It's, a, it's in the middle of our church name. It ought to be in the middle of our name. It ought to be the center of everything that we do, not just as a church, but individually. Acts of random kindness. Not for our glory, but for whose glory? God's glory. Absolutely. 100%. So let me, let me close with this. Um, I love poems, so you'll have to forgive me, but I do like poems. This is a, this is a, uh, a poem I love, love to just end this part on. It says, he couldn't speak before a crowd, he couldn't teach a class, but when he came to Sunday school, he brought the folks a mass. He couldn't sing to save his life, in public couldn't pray, but always his old jalopy was crammed on each Lord's day. Though he could not sing or speak nor teach nor lead in prayer, he listened well. He had a smile. He was always there. With all others whom he brought who lived both near and far, God's kingdom surely prospered, for he had a consecrated car. For he had a consecrated car. For those of you who don't know what the word consecrated is, it means to dedicate a person or thing to a higher purpose. His car was not to take him to get the groceries. His purpose was much higher than that. And God has put things in your hand and words in your mouth that you can speak and you can do and you can say that's going to help people along your path, along your journey. You can share the good news both in word and deed. God gave me a snowblower. And I, I just, oh, God, please make it snow. <laughs> you know? Oh, 14 inches, is that all you can do? You know, come on, I want some real snow, you know? And so last year I, I got out one time, but me and the neighbor across the street, we have eight houses on our street, and then there's a bunch of other neighbors lives on another street, but there's eight houses on our street, so I get out there and I crank it up and I'm snow blowing, and here he comes out of his house. And his wife won't let him snow blow unless I'm out there with him. And so he snow blows one side of the street, and I snow blow the other side of the street, and I have to keep an eye on him because he's older than I am. And so I, I snowblowed 11, 11 driveways. Now, I, snowed one, I snowblowed one driveway. It blew it into the other person's driveway. They had to go to their driveway and blow it back. And so I did that for a while. But I'm counting those as 11 driveways. Right? Uh, I mean, that's... Who's keeping track other than me, right? It, the story is about me. One of the guys, he had said to me, the, the, our, my neighbor across the street says, can we go down and do their driveway? It was about a quarter of a mile walk, so, you know, we're, we're taking our snowblowers. He's got one identical to me. We're, we're walking down the street with our snowblowers, and, uh, and we're snowblowing the street, you know. We're just, we're just hanging out, you know, me and my 80-year-old neighbor, and we're just having a blast. And, and we go down, and this man just had surgery, back surgery, and we, we snowblowed out his driveway, and his wife and kids came out, and they gave us a big hug. And that was fantastic. And on the way back, we did other driveways and stuff. It's not about what I do for them. It's, I said, you know, God gave me this. I give it to you. I'll pray for you 2019. I don't know if he's a believer. I don't know who he is, but he knows that I'm praying for him. Cool thing is that his wife made me some cookies and brought him up. Great reward. <laughs> My reward is even greater in heaven, but I, will, I value the cookies. I value the cookies. So God has given you words to say, He's put things in your hands. Just my prayer is that in 2019, you dedicate every word that you speak, everything that God puts in your hands for his glory. 
There's nothing easier than sharing the good news by word or by deed. Don't make it complicated. Just do whatever God designs you to do. So if you dedicate yourselves and you dedicate the things that God puts in your hands um, to the Lord, just watch what he'll do for you in 2019. I resolved that you would have an amazing year. Not just that you would get great things, but everybody that you comes in contact with, you would say, you know what? I blessed their life. I blessed their life. I did what God wanted me to do. If you resolve to do that, you will have an amazing year, and so will everybody else. There will be hundreds of people who will have a better year because of you. And that's good news. That's the good news. So we've been talking today and last week and even through this series to those who are Christ followers. Maybe you've been a Christ follower for years, maybe for months, maybe for weeks. You've been a Christ follower. But there might be some here today who said, you know what, I've never asked God to wipe my slate clean. You know, he can't do that for me. He won't do that for me. How does that look? I'm going to invite Pastor John to come. He's going to share a little bit with some of you who maybe just have not ever, ever wiped your slate clean. Maybe this is the day that uh, you can turn it over, give it a shake, and get a new slate. 